How's it going, everybody? Jeff Slakey from My Fiber One KMAS, and I'm really happy to be able to spend some time here with the Commissioner of Public Lands here for the great state of Washington, Hillary France. Hillary, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you. We're talking about a, a testimony that you had in last week in, a, in relation to House Bill 1168. Now, it is uh, co-sponsored by Representative Larry Springer of Kirkland and Representative Joel Kretz of Wakanda over in Okanagan County. So a couple both sides of the mountain representatives here to talk about this big issue that I know is, is getting bigger and bigger as the years go on. This is to put into effect a fund that is able to help with the wildfires in Washington. Last year was a terrible year. The year before that, we felt was a terrible year. And year over year, we're seeing more and more acres burned. First, talk to me a little bit about where we're coming from since the turn of the century. Year 2000, the first 10 years, we saw kind of an average amount of wildfire acreage burned. But in the last five or six years, it's skyrocketed. That's right. That's right. I mean, just to give you a big perspective, I actually found a Christmas card from the Commissioner of Public Lands back in like 1963. And it was a real bad fire season, he said in his Christmas card. And that year, there was 640 acres that burned roughly. 640 acres was a bad year. Um, to give you perspective now, roll forward um, 40 plus years later in 2000s, an average year was around 189,000 acres would burn a year. In the last five years, the average is 488,000 acres burned. That's an average. Now, 2015 was the worst year ever with a million acres burned. Um, majority of that central and eastern Washington, we tragically lost the lives of three firefighters and one Daniel Lyons who was significantly burned. Um, and it has only increased in the severity in acres burned, but also in the number of fires and in the geographies we're fighting these fires. Last year was one of our worst, 2020, 812,000 acres burned uh, on both sides of the Cascades. We had uh, the Labor Day firestorm, 600,000 acres burned in 72 hours. That is five times the total amount that burned all of 2019 and more than half of what burned in all of 2015, which had the most amount of acres ever burned, a million acres. And you know, I think the I think historically people, including our legislators, thought this was just an anomaly. Okay, we have a bad fire season. All right, 10 years from now, maybe we'll have another bad fire season. But five out of the last six years have been catastrophic wildfire seasons. It is no longer an anomaly. It is a year-to-year -year reality that we are facing. I mean, do you think that over the years we've just kind of been complacent and, and understanding, well, we're in the evergreen state and it rains all the time and the rain will put the fires out. We see our neighbors down south in Oregon and even further in California, and they've been devastated over the years. Were we just kind of looking at them going, well, you know, they've got more, it's just hotter down there. It's just drier. It's, it, it, it cannot happen here in Washington. I think there is some of that. I think there's a complacency that thinks we are a cold, wet, evergreen state, and that is not going to change. Um, and that the images we've seen in the Californias and the Colorados and even the Australias, well, that's, those, are, those are just southern areas that are hotter and drier. The fact is our climate is changing. We are having hotter, drier periods year after year. We are seeing less rain and more drought. We are also have a challenge where in the past 50 plus years, we have had um, largely been fighting fires through heavy suppression, which has allowed enormous amount of fuel buildup, meaning fire is natural in our forests. What is not natural is how much fuel we have on the forest. And that means we have a lot of dead and dying disease trees because they're stressed um, with less moisture. We also have smaller diameter because fire hasn't been allowed to come in there in a healthy, sustainable way to remove that. And so enormous amount of fuel load, hotter, drier conditions, more stress trees, all it takes is a spark. And what it might have been before a hundred acre fire is now, like we saw with the Cold Spring Fire, a hundred thousand acre fire. 
So let's talk about this House Bill 1168. We'll put the links to in the show notes. What are some of the things that are in this that could be enacted uh, to help with us? And it would be a annual or a biennium every every biennium, $150 million. What is the what is the bulk of that money going to and, and how how would it help? folks here on this side of the mountains as we're kind of at the gateway to the Olympics and then, and the folks on the east side of the mountains where, you know, it's a little drier, it's a little flatter. So for the reality is if we're gonna change the trajectory on of these increasing catastrophic fires, and as we know, the west side, we've had a, a fire almost every year in the last three years in the Olympic rainforest, right? So every part of our state is at risk um, and has seen fire over the last six plus years. If we're going to change the trajectory we're on, we have to invest in three areas, and that's what this legislation does. First, it's wildfire response. We need the resources on the ground when the fire strikes so we can get on them quickly. We need everything from air resources, helicopters, fixed wings. Um, our air resources are critical on initial attack. When the fire starts, we can get on the fire quickly. We can contain it and allow the fire crews to come in on the ground level. Um, two, we need more resources at the local state level of firefighters. We have currently only 73 full-time firefighters in our agency that oversees 13 million acres, right? Our local fire districts, many of them on the front lines are volunteer firefighters um, or they're retiring or nearing retirement and we have not built up the next leadership in firefighting, which is why we usually have to go out to the federal government or other states to get firefighters when we are in crisis, but there are none to be had because California and Oregon and other states are on fire already. So we have investments in wildfire response to get on those fires quickly and put them out. Another key bucket is forest restoration. It is actually going in and restoring 1.25 million acres of forest in central and eastern Washington so that the forest can actually fight these fires on their own because naturally, if they're healthy, they can. It also begins investments in the west side forest on our small forest landowners and federal lands and state lands so that we can change the course that our west side forests are on that is going in the direction that our east side has been as well. And the third is community resilience. We saw with Malden, the town of Malden was completely destroyed in just a few hours. 80% of the homes lost, the city hall, the fire station, the post office. Many of those homes were uninsured and people literally fled with just the clothes on their back. The town of Malden isn't even in the top 25 communities at risk in Washington state. And we have communities that are at greater risk of wildfire destruction and even greater risk than Paradise, California, which we all remember those images from 2018. Uh, Two million homes are at risk in Washington state of wildfire. This would help bring resources to those communities at high risk, help homeowners create that defensible space around their homes, neighborhoods, and also communities with fuel breaks so that we can actually give these communities a fighting chance against wildfire and help it um, our firefighters fight these fires more easily. So you have a lot of buy-in too already from uh, local community leaders, tribal leaders. What about the private sector and those large landholders? I know there's a lot in Mason County of private landholders with huge uh, acreage of lands. Are they open to these types of ideas? And how would how would this help with their their property? I think one of the things I'm most exciting about this bill is first there is broad support um, from a very diverse group. Um, first, uh, we have these, um, this funding and this bill is built off two strategic plans, our forest health plan and our wildfire strategic plan. And we had broad suite of stakeholders from tribes and the environmental community to timber, to our mill industry, to fire chiefs and firefighters, local, state and federal agencies helping build those plans. To these, this legislation is built on those plans and we have broad support and people helping write this bill um, from small forest landowners to large timber landowners like the Warehousers and the Sierra Pacifics. Um, and then we also had tribes have been impacted significantly by fire, especially our Colville Nation. Um, we had investment from tribes, the environment, um, Again, local fire districts, local governments, the cities and counties that are obviously on the front lines of these fires. $150 million a year. Sounds like it's a lot of money up front, but what are the costs 
at the end of a wildfire season. And how much do you think of that 150 million could be uh, saved on the back end? So this is the this is the key point because we know right now our state revenue is impacted, our local and state economies have been impacted by COVID. And to ask for money is, is not an easy thing. But the fact is, we are already paying, on average, $153 million a year to fight these fires. In 2015, when a million acres burned, we spent almost $400 million alone just fighting fires. Um, we, the question here isn't whether we're going to pay for wildfires, we're going to pay for something else like education, transportation, housing. We are already paying. The question is whether we're going to pay to react in the face of smoke and flames and literally just take dollars and throw it into the flames. Or we're going to pay to invest up front and have the resources to get on these fires quickly and contain them to reduce the damage to lives and property and to restore the health of our forest, which actually creates jobs, which actually creates economic opportunity. Um, and here's how the dollars work out. We're spending on average 153 million a year to fight these fires. This bill would create, would spend 125 million a biennium. So over two years to change the trajectory we're on. It's sort of an ounce of repention is worth a pound of cure. And in this case, investing up front will save far more dollars, and in this case, lives, um, than waiting until the, the emergency strikes. What are some of the early reactions to the bill? So on the legislature side, we're having really great positive response. This is something where we have worked tirelessly um, working with legislators, east and west sides of the mountain, Republican and Democrat, House and Senate, um, to really inform them about what this bill does and what needs to be done to change the trajectory on. Everyone largely agrees on the what. They also agree this is a top priority. I think where disagreement has been is on the how. How are we going to fund it? No surprise. Um, so this year what we said is, we don't have that answer at the Department of Natural Resources. We aren't engaged in all the discussions around what are certain funding sources and what's funding XYZ in the legislature. Let's partner with the legislature to help us figure out the how. Um, and so we brought a bipartisan group of House and Senate uh, legislators together to help us think, and it may not be just one funding source, it may be a, a suite of funding sources. You mentioned just a, a handful of full-time fire crew that are available now. What, what about the rest of your uh, staff in that respects and the inventory, the planes, the helicopters? What's the, how are those holding up? I mean, yeah, the so, age of that. So people should know. Uh, people should know how little we've invested in wildfire response. Um, we right now have ten helicopters to fight fires in every corner of the state. They all but two fought in the Vietnam War. They literally have the bullet holes to show it. These are old machines that our mechanics put together part by part. Um, and it, and that covers every corner of the state. And the fire that hit Bonnie Lake not very far from where uh, your communities are. Um, that community, we had three helicopters to fight fires, multiple fires up and down the I-5 corridor and east and west. We couldn't put them all on that fire. And that made it harder for us to actually get on top of that fire and reduce the damage. We had skeleton crews fighting fires in the Cold Spring fire where it was a 15 to 17 person incident management team that should have had 50 to 70 person. We had firefighters at the local and state level fighting fires for 48 plus hours with no break, right? Which is a threat, frankly, to their life and well being. But it's because we had no choice. This would invest just in the next biennium $75 million to hire 100 more firefighters, hand crews, dozer operators. Um, we would get two new fixed wing planes. We'd upgrade and modernize the existing helicopters we have. We'd also be able to add new technology so our, they could fly at night. Right now, because we, they are older machines, they don't have that technology, we have to ground them. Well, the fact is the winds pick up at night and fires keep on moving while we're sleeping. And our firefighters are on the ground. They're fighting fires through the night, but they don't have the air resources to help protect them. We also drive resources down at the local level. The town of Malden, for example, has eight volunteer firefighters, many of them nearing retirement. Um, five of them were fighting fire on a neighbor, neighboring town when Malden was hit. 
Um, we've got to be getting resources down to that local level where our communities, these are our first responders, whether it's in COVID or whether it's a natural disaster like wildfire or earthquake um, or just actually health um, response. And we've got to be making those investments. Yeah, I was just going to actually ask you about that and how the folks in urban settings who may not particularly ever be familiar with a, a forest setting or, or something like that, I know that they'll they'll see the haze or they'll have, you know, troubles breathing when it gets smoky. But do you see that the folks in the urban settings are able to understand this outside just the pictures they see on TV? So I think they are. I think, first of all, we know that every single person in Washington state was impacted by these wildfires last year. And in 2018, when we had the worst air quality in the world from Spokane to Seattle, right? We all were locked in our homes because of COVID. Well, not locked in our home, but we became locked in our homes because of the fires and outside was important to us. So everybody was impacted and it impacts our health as well as our well-being. Everybody, many of our communities, and it's only growing, are also impacted. Those two million residences um, that sit within this wildland urban interface or even the Bonnie Lake Graham area, um, which is just shouting distance from Tacoma probably never thought that wildfire would hit them. I can think about Oregon. I grew up in the Portland area and how parts of Portland metropolitan area were being impacted by the fire. The, we think, and we have this sort of false sense of security that if you are in a highly urbanized area or along the I-5 corridor, you are likely safe because it's too developed. That's not the case. We are seeing more and more fires in that area that are creeping closer to our urban areas and threatening um, every community, frankly, and it's only going to get worse. The third piece, and I'll just say the, the last piece is, at the end of the day, we're all paying for this. It comes out of our taxpayer dollars, right? If, even if we aren't bothered by the smoke or we don't see the flames in our backyard, we are paying for it to the tune of $153 million a year. That is, and that's only 9% of the true cost to our economy and to our health and to our environment. And it, we need to realize that if we're making smart investments with our taxpayer dollars, we would be investing upfront to change the trajectory on, which will get people back clean air, which will get people back healthy forests, which will get people back saving lives, especially our firefighters. What are the next steps for the bill? How can folks uh, speak in favor uh, of this if they so feel? And I know that things have changed a little bit when it comes to uh, making comments known during the session here, but uh, what are the next steps? So I think first and foremost, people, um, we are headed for a, um, a hearing um, on Friday. We're hoping to get an exec out of the um, Rural and Agricultural and Natural Resource Committee, and then it goes through a probes where we're going to start to identify the funding sources. I think it's important for every single person to be reaching out to their legislators and telling them how important it is to be making these investments um, and speaking up. Yeah, those communications are absolutely key because we will be moving right now. We're going to focus on a small set of legislators who are focused on the bill and making it the best it can be, but it is going to go to the larger house and then to the Senate. And we need every legislator to understand that this is a top priority in Washington state. For $150 million per biennium, it'll go a long way to help the savings of the $153 million spent every year as we work to try to fight these wildfires across the state. Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary France, talking about House Bill 1168, and we'll put the links to that in the show notes. Thanks for spending some time with me and explaining this bill to uh, everybody. It's my pleasure. I look forward to coming back. I appreciate it. And everybody be safe.